Hello and welcome. We are about to start our nuclear chemistry chapter today. You can see I have my Geiger counter out. We also have some radioactive sources. I have some desktop speakers here that are connected to the Geiger counter so we can hear the intensity of the radiation measured in counts per minute. So we'll get to that in just a few minutes. In fact, I'm going to turn it down. Well, maybe I'll leave it on just a little bit so you can hear some of what we call background radiation. So we are exposed to radiation continually. Um, we call that background radiation, and we're going to talk a little bit about what that is today. We also have some other sources. Now, um, these sources of radiation were purchased. I'm actually going to move those away from the Geiger counter, so uh, that's not part of the background noise that we're hearing. And we can still hear a certain number of clicks or counts um, as I'm talking here. And that measures the intensity of the radiation in the unit we'll call counts per minute. Now, first of all, let's talk about what ionizing radiation is. We've talked about the electromagnetic spectrum much, much earlier in the year. The electromagnetic spectrum is forms of uh, radiation, both ionizing and non-ionizing. Non-ionizing would be something like heat waves, radio waves, infrared, and visible light. Ionizing radiation would include ultraviolet radiation x-rays and gamma rays. Um, what we're going to talk about in this chapter on nuclear chemistry is ionizing radiation. So let's define that for you. Let me turn the speakers down so we don't hear the clicks any longer. Ionizing radiation is radiation with enough energy Um, so that during an interaction so that during an interaction with an atom it can actually remove electrons from the orbit of that atom so it can remove electrons from uh, the valence energy level or the valence orbit of that atom. And as you know, when you take electrons away from something, you pull away negative charges and you form an ion. So we form a charged particle or an ion. So the radiation has enough energy so that when it slams into that atom or that molecule, it hits it with so much force, it can actually jar electrons loose. And when that happens, we form an ion and that particle becomes um, pretty doggone chemically reactive and it can cause some problems. Now let's talk about um, the discovery of ionizing radiation and actually some properties of that ionizing radiation. We're going to start talking about Ernest Rutherford. Now we talked about him earlier in the year. If you might re recall his gold foil experiment, um, he was the gentleman who discovered the nucleus of the atom. Remember that positive center when he shot alpha particles um, at gold foil and he noticed that some of the particles were actually deflected. He's the guy who discovered the nucleus of the atom. Well, he performed this lead block experiment, which is pretty simple. It's a brick, if you can imagine, made out of lead with a hole drilled in it. And a source of ionizing radiation was put in the back of that brick. And the opening was directed towards a magnetic field. Now, on the other side of this magnetic field was a screen. Now, that screen was made out of zinc sulfide. And it turns out that when zinc sulfide is hit with a piece of our particle of ionizing radiation, it fluoresces or glows. So we could actually track these particles as they went through the magnetic field. Now, as you can see in this diagram, some of the particles were deflected towards the positive pole of the magnet. Now, obviously, they carried a negative charge, right? Opposites attract. And these are called beta particles. Some went straight through. They were not deflected 
by the magnetic field. Those were neutrally charged, those are gamma rays, and some were deflected towards the negative pole. Obviously they carried a positive charge and they are called alpha particles. Now you can see by the trackings of the beta and alpha particles that the beta particles were deflected much more so than the alphas were. That actually has something to do with the mass of the alpha particles. They're they're bigger, they're heavier, so as they pass through the magnetic field, they're not deflected by as much as the betas are. Now I'm going to pull my Geiger counter out again, and we're going to turn it on, and uh, you'll notice that occasionally we'll get a click or a count every so often, and we could count that for a minute, and we could determine the background radiation here, and a unit called, once again, counts per minute. Well, what I want to do is I want to bring a source of... Uh, well, let's bring beta radiation forward first. So we have our beta source here. We'll move the other ones out of the way. We'll bring them close to the detector. And you can see that, uh, that the intensity, of course, builds as we bring it closer to the detector. In fact, we're going to do an experiment later, and we'll measure how intensity decreases as I move the particle farther away from the counter. Now, beta radiation... Um, those particles um, can't penetrate lead very well. So, I have a piece of paper here. Um, and I'm going to put the paper between this, uh, the Geiger counter and the beta source. And you'll notice that most of the particles go straight through. The intensity isn't deterred very much. But now let me replace that piece of paper with a piece of lead. And you can see that lead does a really good job at stopping just about, all the beta, just about all the beta particles. So beta can be stopped by a relatively thin piece of lead. Now let's put the beta away and let's pull out gamma this time. So here's my gamma source. And we're going to do the same thing. Um, Gamma is not quite as intense as my beta. We'll put that there, and we'll put a piece of paper between the source. And uh, you can see the paper does not does not stop that. Let's try the same thing with lead, and you'll see that uh, that the lead doesn't stop it either. So the penetrating ability the penetrating ability of, of gamma is much better than that of beta. Let's do that again. Here's my beta source. Okay, and now we'll do that again with gamma. And here's my gamma. So with the gamma, it really didn't make a difference if the, if the lead shielding was there. Uh, the gamma has the best penetrating ability of all. Um, beta is the next best, and my alpha, uh, well, unfortunately, with the Geiger counter we have, uh, it actually cannot detect any alpha radiation, but um, alpha radiation uh, would be stopped by a piece of paper. Your skin could actually stop alpha radiation. Beta can penetrate paper, but as we saw, it can't penetrate lead or aluminum. Uh, can penetrate your skin and soft tissue, but uh, can't penetrate bone tissue. Gamma radiation can penetrate paper, aluminum, and several sheets of lead. In fact, let's take a look here. I have a total of four sheets of lead. And uh, let's see what happens here with the gamma radiation. So we'll turn our volume back up. And... Uh, Let's see, there's our gamma, and one piece of lead, doesn't do anything. Let's put all four pieces there and see what happens. Of course, we're getting some distance come into play here. And you can see that even with uh, four pieces of lead, the gamma radiation penetrates quite well. So, gamma radiation its penetrating ability is the best of the group, and then comes beta, and then alpha. Now let me show you if we had an image like this. Here's a person. You can see that 
what I'm trying to tell you is that alpha radiation you're protected quite well by just your skin or clothing. Beta radiation can penetrate your skin and some soft tissue, but it cannot penetrate bone tissue. And gamma radiation goes straight on through you, has the greatest penetrating ability. Now a little analogy here um, that might help clear this up. I'm going to turn my volume down again. Um, Let's say that between me and you, so obviously that's you behind this chain link fence, um, there's a chain link fence. And uh, the objective in my little game I have here is to hit you. And I have three things that I can throw at you. Um, so one of those things is a baseball. So you can imagine as I rear back with a baseball, um, you're not going to be too worried back there because that chain link fence is going to stop the baseballs completely. Uh, next up, is a ping pong ball. And so if I rear back with a ping pong ball, you're absolutely correct. Many of those particles are going to make it through the chain link fence, but are you going to be very bothered by the ping pong ball? Probably not, but most of them do penetrate. Finally, um, the last thing I have uh, to hit you with is the light from a flashlight. So if you can imagine me shining a light at you, of course you're terrified, aren't you? because that uh, light can pass right through the chain link fence and it's going to do absolutely nothing to you except maybe annoy you a little bit. Well, that's sort of analogous to the size of our alpha, beta, and gamma particles. The reason that alpha can't penetrate very well is because the particles are so massive. And in the second part of this video, you'll see why. Obviously, beta particles are a bit smaller, so they can penetrate really well, but they're not too damaging. And finally, gamma radiation penetrates the best, but as far as damage is concerned, it's not going to affect you very much um, because it's just, well, you'll find out in a bit, it's just high-frequency electromagnetic radiation um, made up of tiny, massless particles called photons. Alrighty, well, that's our introduction to nuclear chemistry. Uh, we're going to go on with part two here, so stay tuned.